Thomas Gray sat in the graveyard, a thin rain misting his hooded face. Behind him, the local park lay forlorn and abandoned, devoid of any noise except the lonely creak of a rusting swing. The world had fallen into ruin. The laughter of children long since disappeared. The children of this new world were taught from an early age the danger of wild laughter and joyous exuberance, but Thomas didn't mind. The world had been a noisy, chaotic place before the Lazarus virus had swept across it, devastating nation after nation. The hungry dead had swarmed and multiplied, their terrible hunger consuming all in their path until only the last vestige of mankind survived. Always on the run. Chased by a relentless enemy that groaned and slouched its way through both day and night. Hordes of the dead in your city, your town, and eventually at your door. Some said it was an act of God. God's punishment for the sins of mankind. If that were true... Then Thomas had surely had it coming. He tried to push away the memories of that night, but they invaded his thoughts. Images flashed through his tired mind. The lonely heath, a rope, a shovel, blood on his gloved hands, his latest victim, groaning back to life. Jess, he whispered into the rain. Her name had been Jess. He had met the girl online, a Lonely Hearts dating site. It was a brave new world, no need to go out hunting anymore. Now the victims could be chosen in the comfort of his own home. Even their likes and dislikes were at his fingertips. It was like... It was like shooting fish in a barrel. A couple of weeks of mindless chatter, sometimes even less. Then a meeting was arranged. Always at a public place, usually a dinner date. There, Thomas would use his good looks and charms to lull his victims into a false sense of security. Sometimes they would leave the venue with him, other times they would not. Funnily enough, it was the ones that left with him on those first dates that usually survived. There was no fun, okay. With Jess, it had taken four dates over the span of two months before he could finally get her alone with a promise of a moonlit drive up to the heath. Perhaps she was expecting sex, or some kind of sexual encounter. But she received much, much more. Thomas wasn't into sex. He was into murder. Ever since he had returned from Afghanistan, the urge to kill had been with him and haunted him day and night. He had resisted at first, even thought about taking his own life, but in the end, he had given in to his urges. Strangulation was his favorite method to feel that power in his hands as he squeezed the life from his victims, the pure joy of watching hope fade as their struggles became weaker, and the light faded from their eyes. In that moment, he was God, a master of death over life. Sometimes he would take them to the brink, then ease up, letting them take a desperate, gasping breath before bearing down hard and finishing the job. It had been that way with Jess as she lay on a blanket in the tall grass, kissing him hard. He had climbed between her legs, pinning her in place. She had scrambled frantically at his belt buckle, but he, he had smacked her away and clamped his hands down around her throat. She had smiled up at him then, perhaps thinking it was some kind of kinky game, but her smile... Her smile had faded as his fingers tightened around her slender throat. How she had struggled, beating at his arms, clawing at his face. But it had all been over far too soon, and now she was dead. A toy to be discarded, buried and called missing, like all the rest. Thomas was a great believer in being prepared, and her grave had already been dug the previous night, if you called a shallow hole a grave. 
He had been in the process of dragging her towards the grave when he had felt a small twitch on her lifeless body. At the time, he had thought nothing of it. The dead often twitched and jerked as the body settled into death. It was only when she sat up as he threw the first spade of dirt across her face that he knew something was terribly wrong. Thomas had killed enough people in the war and as a serial murderer to know dead when he saw it, and the girl had been most definitely dead. Even when she began to claw her way out of the grave, he, he still could not believe what he was seeing. He had stood there paralyzed, his mouth working but issuing no sound as she climbed to her feet, a low groan spilling from between her slack, drooling lips, her pale, dirt-covered arms reaching towards him. When her cold fingers brushed his face, his paralysis broke, and with a cry of terror, he jumped back, swinging his spade, crashing it into her. She staggered back, but did not go down, but came on, her jaw chomping. Thomas let out a curse and hit her again. This time she went down, but she still tried to rise as he beat at her, begging her to lay still. At last, in an act of pure desperation, he brought the spade end of the shovel coming crashing down onto her head, splitting her skull almost in two. And with the final act of defilement, she lay still. It was only then that he heard sirens in the night and noticed the flickering firelight in the distance as London started to burn. Thomas did not know what was happening, but a part of him, perhaps the animal cunning that had kept him alive so long, had told him to flee. And so he had, leaving his latest victim to rot. He jumped in his car and headed west towards Cornwall. There was a village there named... There was a village there named Mavigazy, where he had holidayed as a child. He had always loved it there, and he figured it'd be a great place to lay low until whatever this was blew over. Little did he know that it would never blow over, but get terrifyingly worse. Still, he had been right about one thing. He had been safe in Mavigazy. The village itself was in a rural area 15 miles from the nearest big town and 35 miles from Cornwall's only city, set in a natural steep-sided valley with its back to the sea, and only one road leading into the village. It had been easy to defend. The villagers, always an isolated lot, had mobilized almost immediately, setting up a large barricade across the road with rusting caravans and trailers, burnt-out cars and heavy furniture. The barricade was manned both day and night by armed men and anyone approached. Anyone approaching, alive or dead, was shot on sight. Luckily, Thomas had managed to slip in between the barricade and was in place and had integrated himself with the locals by helping out here and there and everywhere to make sure the village was properly defended. After a time, they had accepted him. The days had gone quickly. Scavenging parties had been set up to plunder nearby villages of any resources, and of course, there was always fishing boats and barricades to be manned. Occasionally, the dead would arrive, but they were quickly taken care of by the swarming villagers, and that's the way it had been for the first eight months. In that time, Thomas had suppressed his killing urge by murdering the dead. He had soon got himself a reputation as a fierce fighter and slayer of the damned. Thomas. A heavy hand fell on his shoulder, dragging him back from the pass with a start. Hey, Thomas, we need you down at the harbor. It's happening again. Thomas looked up at the tall man before him. His name was Joseph Martin, a fisherman and town counselor. Come on, pal, he said hurriedly. It's happening again. The harbor's crawling with him. Fuck, Thomas cursed, leaping to his feet. How many? Forty, Joseph replied, breaking into a run. Maybe fifty. Fuck. That goddamn ship's been nothing but trouble. The trawler's been out this morning? Yeah, Joseph said a little breathlessly. All morning, my brother Tim was on board. They must have scooped up nearly a hundred of them off the seafloor. They took them to Polstreth Beach, burned the lot. I figured that's why you was up at the old graveyard to avoid the smell. Only thank God it's low tide and those bastards can't get out. Thomas 
said nothing to this, but carried on running. They were entering the village square now, running past the old war memorial, down Halfpenny Lane, past the boarded-up post office, and out onto the harbor front. Holy shit, Thomas gasped, stopping dead. The harbor floor was crawling with zombs, their awful moaning and rotting flesh. They were entering the village square now, running past the old war memorial, down Halfpenny Lane, past the boarded-up post office, and out onto the harbor front. Holy shit, Thomas gasped, stopping dead. The harbor floor was crawling with zombs, their awful moaning and rotting flesh defiling the air. A pike was thrust into his hand by a nearby fisherman whose name Thomas couldn't recall. Come on, boy, the old-timer said. Better get this over with. Thank God my old girl Bessie died before she could see such nonsense as this. Thomas said nothing but grabbed up the offered spear and joined the men at the mouth of the harbor, where a small bassinet had been placed, a screaming infant inside. The child was in no danger, not high up on the harbor's concrete sides, but its wailing was attracting the dead. The people of Mavigacy were fishermen through and through. They knew the value of good bait. Come on, Tom, Joseph said, joining the melee. And someone get the baby out of here before one of those damn fools kicks it over the side. The baby was quickly thrust into its mother's waiting arms and whisked away to safety as Thomas and the rest of the men continued their attack, piercing skulls and puncturing eye sockets as they dodged and scrambled away from the grasping hands and flailing arms. One man's boot was snagged and he was dragged screaming over the side, the dead falling upon him, tearing at his throat, tearing open his guts with rotten, twisting fingers. Bring the patrol, someone cried. Moments later, the whole horde was alight, setting the ragged band of men reeling back from the stinking smoke and terrible heat. Some of the dead went down under the terrible inferno, but others remained, blackened and scorched, like some nightmare scene from Dante's Inferno. Outraged, the men of the village renewed their attack, their fear and disgust lending them strength as they mopped up the last of their tormentors. When it was all over, Thomas sat down heavily on a nearby bench where once tourists had sat eating ice cream and enjoying the good Cornish weather. Such time seemed dim now and far away. You okay, Tom? Joseph said, wiping the sweat from his brow. We have to get rid of that ship, Thomas replied, breathlessly, looking at the battered cruise liner that lay just off the harbor's outer wall. Those damn things on board keep swarming into the ocean. And trawlers have been scooping them up day and night, and still they manage to get ashore. Joseph shrugged uncontrollably. The town council had a vote on it last night. We can't destroy it, Tom. Not yet, anyway. Those things are like floating cities. The resources on board would be enormous. Resources? Thomas laughed. And just how the hell are we supposed to get at them? The side of the thing must be... A a hundred, no, maybe two hundred feet tall. And even if we could get on board, who would who would be mad enough to go over there in the first place with those things crawling all over it? Joseph looked at the floor guilty. You're shitting me, Thomas said. Me? You're thinking of sending me? Look, Tom, you came here from God knows where. You didn't say and we didn't ask. It was a crazy time. You helped us with the barricade, driving back the dead, but I will tell it to you straight. A lot of people don't want you here. Times were tough. Supplies were running low, but still, we let you stay. And then, there was that unfortunate incident with Anne. That had nothing to do with me, Tom said quickly. Now, now, Joseph said, holding up a restraining hand. I never said it was. But that old doctor threw some suspicion your way. You and Anne had been stepping out together for a few weeks, then all of a sudden she hangs herself. The doc wasn't happy with his findings. Something about the marks on her throat not quite matching up and such. And of course, everyone knew by then that old Doc White wasn't what he used to be. He'd been having forgetful spells. And right next day, he wrote it off as an accidental death. No more was said about it. Still. More talk about throwing you out of the village, but I I and a few other voices on the parish council, your your good friend Matthew Fancy, being one of the loudest, they clamored for you. But it was a close thing. 
becomes a very close thing indeed. So what you're saying is, I owe you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, Thomas. You do owe us. You're a hard man. There's no doubting that. But you would have died out there if we hadn't taken you in. And you know it. Thomas nodded his head. And I'm grateful for it. But going over there is suicide. The place is crawling with those things. Is it? Oh, Joseph said, taking the binoculars from around his neck and offering them to Thomas. Look at the deck. Tell me what you see. Thomas did as he was bid and focused in on the derelict craft. Joseph talking in his ear all the while. When that thing first washed up near our shore, the ship was crawling with the dead. You saw the activity on the shore. Threw themselves into the ocean to get at us. Well, our boys in the fishing fleet soon saw to that. We send out our trawlers and scoop those sons of bitches right up off the ocean floor. Yeah, a few got through, like today. And just like today, we handled it. Arada's already been made up for and approved. The harbor and nearby beaches will be patrolled day and night for the foreseeable future. What I'm trying to say, Tom, is anything that was on board is now either dead or floating around the bottom of the sea, giving you a clear path. Bullshit, Tom said. You're reaching and you know it. Yeah, the decks are clear. I'll give you that. But what about below deck? There could be hundreds of those things still on board. Well... Joseph said, smiling. Now, sadly, that's what you're going to find out for us. We need this, Tom. That place is a treasure trove. Food, water, medicine, blankets, pots, pans, clothes, everything we could ever dream of. We just need you to take a quick look over there and come back. Recon mission. If you will. And when you return, if, Thomas interrupted. Okay, if, Joseph conceded. If you return, then we'll send a larger force, grab up the supplies, and leave. Why just not send a large force now? Armed the teeth. Try and take the ship over. Why send me alone? Joseph sighed. Stood up, brushing the seat of his pants. One man may go unnoticed, Tom, and army wouldn't. I'm sorry, Tom, but that's the way it has to be. Okay. Tom said, knowing he was trapped. Do as he was told, follow the orders like a good little puppet, and be expelled from the safety of the village. Okay. I'll go and take a look. But if I die, I'm coming back to bite you on the ass. Sure, that's the spirit, Tom, he said, patting the other man's shoulder. That's the spirit. Early the next day, Thomas was bundled aboard a small trawler with the unfortunate name of the Betty Blue. There weren't that many firearms in the village, but Thomas had had the pick of all of them. In the end, he had gone with a sawn-off shotgun and a wicked-looking hand sickle, which he had tucked in his belt. Still, he knew that if he ran into a horde, he was royally fucked. As they drew nearer, Thomas took some time to look the derelict ship over, he didn't know much about the cruise ship, but this one seemed small compared to the ones he'd seen on TV before the fall. There seemed to be roughly six decks, some of the portals smashed and splintered. The hull that had once been white had turned a dull gray and was covered in barnacles and deep rusting gouges. The scene was one of neglect and decay. Thomas shuddered, thinking of this ghost ship sailing through the night's blackened seas. The sound of cold waves sliding against its rotting hull. The moans of the hungry dead inside, wandering its shadow-infested halls. Thomas! The captain shouted from the nearby wheelhouse. Come up here a minute, will you? Thomas dragged his eyes away from the ship and scrambled up into the wheelhouse. There's your way in, the captain pointed. As they rounded the prow of the ship... Thomas followed his finger, noticing a section of the hull lying open about thirty feet above the water. What is that? he asked. It's a runabout bay. Come again? Thomas said, raising a quizzical eyebrow. The captain sighed. The runabout bay, you know, when 
Those rich folks want ferrying to and fro from the ship or a fancy cruise ship round the island. They would use a runabout. Think of it as a small pleasure cruiser. It would also be used as another lifeboat in emergencies. I noticed it a few days ago when the council asked me to recon the ship. Okay, Thomas said. That's a way in. Let's get to it. Twenty minutes later, with the help of a rope ladder and much cursing, he managed to scramble on board the derelict craft, keeping his eyes open for any sign of movement. But there was nothing. Only the pounding of the ocean and the saying of the wind. I'll wait for you here, the captain yelled up to him. Try not to get yourself killed. If you're not back in two hours, I'm out of here. Thomas said nothing, but ventured further inside, his eyes alert for any kind of movement, but there was only peeling paint and slippery seaweed underfoot. How the hell are you still afloat? Thomas whispered, not liking the sound of his own voice and the oppressive silence. Slowly, carefully, he made his way towards a small metal staircase that led upward into the ship's dark interior. On a nearby wall was a small plastic plaque with a yellowed curling map inside. Thomas glanced it over, noting the crew's quarters on the next level and the galley on the level after that. Okay, he whispered. Let's start there. Flicking off the safety, he unstrapped his shotgun and made his way upstairs, wincing as his footfalls rang out in the metal steps. At the top of the stairs was a pair of swinging doors. Each one had a small porthole filled with dirty glass. Thomas wiped at it with his wet sleeve of his jacket and glanced through. He was looking down a narrow hallway with a red, threadbare carpet. Cabin doors ran the length of the hall, some open, others tightly shut. Taking a deep breath, he pushed his way through, cursing under his breath at the creaking doors. For a moment, he just stood there, his heart pounding, waiting for a shadowy figure to shamble from one of the cabins, but there was nothing. Only a deafening silence and a drum-like thud of his own heartbeat that rang in his ears. For a moment, he considered fleeing, just turning about and getting the hell out, but he had made a lot of mistakes in his life and committed so many atrocities that perhaps, perhaps there was redemption here. Or, if nothing else, a reckoning. Taking a deep breath, he crept forward, checking the first cabin. The door was open, but the room had been completely destroyed. Broken furniture and bloody sheets lay upon the floor, giving evidence of a gargantuan struggle, and yet... And yet there was no bodies. Only bloody footprints leading out of the room and away down the hall almost lost in the matted redness of the threadbare carpet. The next room that Thomas came to was tight shut, and he licked his lips nervously. He reached out a shaking hand towards the tarnished brass handle before quickly shoving it open. The smell hit him then, and sent him gagging and reeling away. He took a deep breath, but that only made things worse, dragging the foul smell down into his lungs, sliming the back of his throat. Jesus, he groaned taking a strained bandana from his pack and quickly wrapping it around his face before heading back in. There was a corpse in the corner, long dead, and in the later stages of decay. The body was slumped over, back against the wall, head almost touching the floor. A gun lay in what was left of its rotting hand. A black bloodstain flecked with grayish matter and shards of bone decorated the wall. Small testament to a desperate death. Thomas turned towards the neatly made bed, meaning to cover the body with a sheet, but stopped when he saw the envelope. The word Marsh, written across the front in a hurried scrawl. For a moment he considered just leaving well enough alone, but in the end, his curiosity went out and he tore the letter open and began to read. My dearest Marsha, I have been bitten by one of those things, and I don't have much time. I have seen what happens to those who are infected, and I won't let that happen to me. I know you may never see this letter, but I want you to know I love you, Marcia. 
I always have. Ever since I first saw you that day in that park, it, it was you. It's always been you. I hope wherever you are, you and the girls are safe. I only wish there had been time to see their precious faces once again. To hold them one last time. I hope God will forgive me for what I must do. And I hope to see you and the children once again in heaven. I love you, Marcia, now and forever. Your loving husband, John. Jesus, Thomas whispered, letting the letter slide from his fingers. There was something welling up in him now. A feeling he thought he'd never feel again. Compassion. Compassion and a terrible dread of this place. He had to get out as soon as possible. He would quickly check the mess hall, the kitchens, then he would leave. Enough is enough, goddammit. Quickly he turned, making his way towards the end of the hall, ignoring the other doors, and heading for the stairwell marked kitchens. At the top of the stairs was another set of swinging doors leading into a short hallway where another set of double doors lay slightly ajar. Thomas pushed through but came to a screeching halt when he heard the first groans of the hungry dead. Crouching, gun at the ready, he scurried over to the door and slowly raised his head up towards the porthole-like window, meaning to get a quick glimpse and then head out. But what he saw stopped him in his tracks. The kitchens were teeming with the dead most of them dressed in the remains of chef whites, waiters' uniforms. They slouched and they staggered, banging their rusting ovens, pulling over pots and pans. As Thomas looked on in horror, one of the zombies stood up from a nearby table, one that had been slouched over. It picked up a can of peaches, grabbing a tin opener, and it began to crack the tin open. Thomas's mouth dropped open as his shotgun clattered from his nerveless fingers. The zombie quickly looked up, straight into his staring face. It was then that Thomas realized he was looking into the face of a young girl. Sixteen, perhaps a little older. She was covered in dirt and disheveled, but very much alive. The girl, seeing his face, let out a scream, jumped up, rushing across the room. She barreled through the door into his shocked arms. You're real, she sobbed. You're really real. Thomas was about to reply when the first of the dead pushed its way past the door and lunged for Thomas, completely ignoring the girl. With a cry, he grabbed it by the throat, narrowly escaping its chomping jaws. Stop that, the girl cried, and grabbed the zombie by its dusty clothes, dragging its wasted body down to the floor. Another zombie pushed through the and fell over the first. Come on, the girl cried. They'll kill you. How? Thomas babbled. Why did they not attack you? Not here, the girl said, running ahead. Do you have a boat or something? Yes, Thomas said running to catch up, down the stairs, on the cruise deck. The girl did not answer, but clearly knew where she was going as she fled down the stairs. Behind them, the dead groaned and slouched after them. They were in the hallway now, running past the room with a terrible letter, and it seemed to Thomas the entire ship was coming to life. All around them, the shadows seemed deeper and matted carpet clinging to its feet as if determined to hold them back. Just as they made the second set of steps, the door behind them banged open and a horde of zombies fell through it, their terrible groans of hunger reverberating round the narrow halls. Quickly, the girl moaned. For God's sake, hurry! Winded, almost out of breath, Thomas pushed forward, almost falling down the last set of stairs through the swinging doors and onto the seaweed-strewn deck, glad for the frigid air that pierced his lungs. Gasping, he shambled to the edge and signaled the captain. Start her up! They're coming! The captain, hearing the raw panic in Thomas's voice, ran to the wheelhouse and with a roar of smoke, started up the Betty's engines. Thomas looked around, desperately searching for the ladder, but the captain had taken it down. The ladder! He screamed as the first of the dead shambled onto the deck. No time, the girl yelled. We have to jump. The dead were pouring onto the deck now, reaching with shredded fingers. With a cry, she jumped into the freezing waters below, quickly followed by Thomas. The dead did not hesitate, but lunged after them, falling all around them as the pair bobbed to the surface. Quickly, the captain yelled, pulling the girl on board. Before they swamp the boat, 
Thomas swam with all of his might, the cold seeping into his bones. He grabbed the side of the trawler. The captain's strong hands reached down and dragged him on board. And just then, a rotten arm grabbed at his flailing legs, trying to drag him back under. With a cry, he kicked the creature in the face over and over, disintegrating its rotten features. Suddenly, suddenly, there was a flash of silver as the girl ripped the sickle from his belt and with a cry, swinging into the creature, almost decapitating it as it sank below the growing waves. Are you okay? The captain said as Thomas fell onto the deck, gasping for air. Move! Thomas managed to scream as another rotting body plummeted into the nearby water. Get us the fuck out of here! The captain did as he was bid, scrambling into the wheelhouse and throttling away from the accursed ship. When they had reached a safe distance, the captain stopped the engine and grabbed up a couple of blankets from the emergency stores, giving one to the girl and the other to Thomas. "'Why the hell are you stopping?' Thomas asked. "'We ain't going nowhere until you explain what the hell's going on. Who the hell is she?' he said, pointing to the shivering girl. "'How did she survive?' "'My name's Becca. I'm immune.' "'Bullshit!' captain said. It's true, Thomas said. I saw it. She was there, living right among them. They never went after her, not once. Look, the girl said, raising up her soaking sweater and showing the multiple bite marks on her arm. The wounds were old and white with age. On the first night, people on the ship started to turn and bite people. I was bit just after my parents were killed. I got sick, real sick, with a fever. I thought I was going to die. I was burning up inside. I I wished for death, but then I got suddenly better. But I was alone and heartbroken about my parents. I wanted death. I, I left my cabin looking for it, but the dead, they wouldn't attack me. Even when I beat them, they wouldn't kill me. Eventually, I learned to live with them. They ignored me and I them. Then you came along, she said, smiling at Thomas. And you saved me. That smile. That smile stirred something in Thomas, something... something dark. He tried to push it away, but it would not go. The girl was immune. This could mean a whole new beginning. She could... She could potentially save hundreds of lives, perhaps thousands, but... but... But what if she were to die? How many would die with her death? How many victims? The girl had such power. The power over life, over death. Death over life. One death would be the equivalent of thousands. A thousand lives in her hands. In his hands. The power of a god. Thomas whispered. What? The captain said, drawing closer. What was that, Tom? Death. Thomas sighed, climbing to his feet. This was his destiny. The destiny to end the world. The captain gave a cry of alarm and the madness in Tom's eyes and drew back, but he was too late. With a snarl, Thomas grabbed him by the hair and slammed his face over and over again to the hard metal side of the trawler, until it was nothing but a bloody ruin. The girl behind him screamed as Thomas tossed the now-dead captain into the churning waters. He turned towards her, bloody fingers snapping open and closed. Life over death, he grinned, closing in. Death over life. In the bloody dusk, a lone trawler chugged its way into Mavagasy Harbor, bouncing its way to port. A lone figure hidden from the waiting men by the shadows of the coming night staggered and fell into the harbor's concrete side. With a cry of alarm, the men ran towards the prone figure, Joseph Martin in the lead. It was a girl, dirty and disheveled, her throat bruised and lumpy, 
In her hand, she held a bloody sickle. He tried to kill me, she croaked. Even when I told him, he tried to kill me. Who? What? Martin gasped. Who are you? But the girl had already passed out. Take her, he signaled to one of the nearby men. Take good care of her. Give her whatever she needs. The men all hurried to help, murmuring questions to each other as they carted the girl off into the growing night, leaving only Joseph behind. Suddenly there was a low groan from the shadows. Tom, Joseph called, his hands going to the knife at his belt. That's you, Tom? Captain? Who's there? Joseph, a voice gasped. Joseph, that you? Quickly, Joseph hurried aboard and scrambled to the wheelhouse. That's where he found Thomas slumped in a corner in a pool of his own blood, his hand desperately trying to hold on to his insides. Jesus, Tom, Joseph gasped, kneeling down beside him. What happened to you? Who did this? Was it the girl? Yeah, Tom wheezed. It was the girl. I, I, I tried to attack her, Joe. I tried to kill her. Why? Why, Tom? It doesn't matter anymore. She's immune, Joseph. Do you understand? He choked, coughing up blood. She's immune. She, she is immune. You, you have to look after her. I tried, Joe. I, I, I tried, but there's no redemption, Joseph. There's no. There's, there's no redemption. Tom, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll go get help. Joseph tried to stand, but Thomas grabbed him down with the last of his failing strength. No, Joseph, Joseph, no. Sometimes death is better. For some dead, is, dead is better. Tom, you're not making any sense. You're in shock. But his words fell on deaf ears as the light faded from Thomas's eyes. Without a word, Joseph pulled his knife, pierced the back of Tom's skull, and closed his friend's eyes. He got up, and he strolled into the night. If what Thomas said was true, then there was a chance, a slim chance that the world could build anew. And some chance was better than no chance at all. Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or listening to tonight's episode, this October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that if you're on a cold autumn night and you need a warm drink, that my wife sells tea. There's tea available at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those themed off of creepypastas, horror icons, horror monsters, and Dungeons and & Dragons. And if you order that creepypasta set with the Mr. Creepypasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these stories, uh, well, probably about 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel icon sticker. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks her to do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you, all of you, 
who are supporting me on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Champinsky, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Anne Charon, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Ryan Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy. Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>